Good evening and welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council Future of Asia Conference. I'm Terry McCarthy and I'm President of the Council. So I and my great staff, I and my great staff and our volunteers and our interns who've worked so hard to put this together are delighted to welcome you all here. especially our 60 speakers who've come from all over the world. Um, some of you, I know, barely escaped Typhoon Moranti, uh, which crashed into Taiwan and then headed on to China, one of the biggest typhoons we've seen in the last 30 years. They're now calling it a super typhoon. I think it had top gusts of 230 miles an hour, which is, I guess, faster than Formula One cars. Uh, anyway, glad that you all made it here. Um, some of you in this room might remember Typhoon York, in Hong Kong in 1999, it was actually quite a popular typhoon because it blew out all the windows of the Inland Revenue Department. And if you recall, those of you who were there, people's tax returns were blowing through the sodden streets of Wan Chai. I think income tax deductions hit an all-time high that year. Nobody was really complaining about that. Um, let me first uh, welcome some people we have here. I want to welcome our board members who are here with us tonight, our new chairman, uh, Michael Siegel, uh, Bob Abernathy, um, Lynn Booth, uh, Ina Coleman, Ray Frankel, John Hotchkiss, Sarah Ketterer, Frank Kilpatrick, Elliot Ponchik, Scott Porter, Andrew Tavacoli, Charlie Weber, and David Zurisher. You're all very welcome. Uh, welcome also to the members of the Consular Corps who are with us tonight. We have uh, uh, consular represent representation here from Austria, Australia, Bangladesh, Chile, China, France, Kuwait, Japan, New Zealand, Peru, Spain, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates. You're all very welcome. And a big thank you to all our sponsors. And I'm going to read them all out because without sponsors, this conference would not have been possible. We're very grateful for all your support. A lot of companies here in, in Los Angeles have enormous interests in Asia. So thank you so much to JM Eagle, PlasPro Inc., UCLA Center for World Health, Wells Fargo Bank, East West Bank, uh, Etihad Airways, Netflix, JD Power, Northrop Grumman, Sunrider International, Princess Cruises, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, Bank of the West, Silicon Valley Bank, Merrill Lynch, and Mireille Wealth Management. I know a lot of you are in the room here, and we thank you very much for your support. So some of you were here earlier for our 5 o'clock panel uh, where we asked, 10 speakers to do the impossible to talk about the future of Asia in three minutes. It was kind of an interesting brain game. Um, but uh, as I mentioned then, uh, the inspiration for this entire conference really is the calculation that by 2030, Asia will have two thirds of the world's middle class, which will be about some, some three billion people. Uh, and that is up from maybe 500 million in 2009. So the, the rate of growth is just phenomenal. And as we said, this, in many ways, is, is good news. It means a lot of new opportunities for people, but it does come with some challenges, too. Uh, there will be, of course, increased competition for resources around Asia, uh, and, of course, more money means more powerful toys for the various military forces in the region. So tonight's keynote speech, uh, which you will hear later after you've eaten, uh, from Admiral Harry Harris, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command, will focus on how to ensure that Asia's continued rise is a peaceful one, which is so very important, not just for everyone who lives in Asia, but also for us. Uh, I think it should be clear by now that uh, our growth is contingent on Asia's growth and vice versa. And we don't win if they don't win as well. Um, in the meantime, please enjoy your lunch or your dinner. Uh, it's been a busy day. Um, and we'll be back to you soon uh, with our keynote speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before I, I get the main event tonight going, I should point out there are some super smart people amongst our speakers and our attendees, and a number of them have written some very good books. And there is a bookstore outside where we're selling a lot of the books that have been written by people at this conference. So when you have a spare moment, uh, feel free to check that out um, and learn more. I have been learning a lot recently from a lot of their books. Um, our Speaker of the night will be introduced by Devan Maharaj, who is the editor-in-chief 
and publisher of the LA Times, a newspaper that, for very obvious reasons, spends a lot of time thinking about Asia. Devon. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Devan, as you heard, Devan Maharaj, editor of the Los Angeles Times. We are proud to be the Los Angeles World Affairs Council med media partner in this Future of Asia conference. Let's hear it for the board of the World Affairs Council, President Terry McCarthy. <laughs> and, and his fine staff for having the foresight to host this very important conference. I personally am honored to have the opportunity to introduce, to introduce a keynote speaker for tonight, Admiral Harry Harris. The, <laughs> wait until you hear him talk. <laughs> the Admiral and I sh um, share a Tennessee um, connection, so after his speech tonight, you get to vote on who has the best Tennessee accent. <laughs> This conference comes at a very important time for our region. It's undeniable that the futures of Los Angeles, Los Angeles and Asia are intertwined. You need only re um, read the LA Times, and this is a plug time, weekly China box office report, John, Jonathan Gold's latest review of modern Korean cuisine, or a great story about the surfer girls in Bangladesh to know that we are in the midst of a major cultural and economic mashup. We, in a, we are in a unique position here in Southern California. About 15% at least of the population here is Asian. The ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are the gateway for trade between the US and Asia. The US, China, and Japan have the largest national economies in the world, and we all face each other across the Pacific. The region's newest and tallest skyscraper, the Wilshire Grand, which the LA Times is chronicling ever so often on the front page, represents a $1 billion statement by Korean Airlines that Los Angeles is at the heart of that conversation and that this group and the LA Times will have to help lead our ongoing dialogue. There's a lot riding on our future. That's why I'm delighted to welcome tonight's keynote speaker, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command. Admiral Harris. Admiral Harris is responsible for all the U.S. forces in the Indo-Pacific region, which stretches from the west coast of the United States of, um, to the west coast of India and from the Arctic to the Antarctic. He'll correct me if I was wrong on that one. <laughs> Admiral Harris was born in Japan and raised in Tennessee and Florida. <laughs> He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy. He was the first Asian American to, to achieve the rank of Admiral in the U.S. Navy, and he's the highest ranking Japanese American. If I listed all of his many achievements and distinctions, I, would, I assure you there'd be very little time left for him to speak, truly. So please give a hearty LA welcome to Admiral Harry Harris, <laughs> Jr., Commander of the Pacific Command. Never follow a tall man on the podium. <laughs> Let me back this thing down a little bit. <clears throat> thanks, uh, Devon, for that warm welcome. Uh, everyone probably thinks Devon was chosen to introduce me because he is the editor and publisher of the LA Times, a prestigious honor to be sure. But after speaking with him tonight, and as he mentioned in his introductory remarks, I'm convinced that he was chosen to introduce me because he went to the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga just a couple of hours south from my hometown. He knows how to say y'all, which automatically means he's refined in my book. <laughs> it also means that he's likely the only person here tonight who'll be able to understand the nuances of my Tennessee accent. And his wife's maiden name is Harris. I I'm not making this up. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Uh, I've heard that you have 
60 speakers that are going to follow me tonight. So I hope you all have a lot of coffee. Uh, and I'm glad I got to go first here. But because I'm sure uh, that you'll, uh, you've heard a lot of the acknowledgments over the course of this conference, I'm going to dispense with the normal litany of acknowledgments. Uh, and I'll try to keep uh, uh, that part of my remarks short. But I'd like to see a, a show of hands for folks here tonight who are from LA. Uh, I, I'm told that there's a shoe store here in Beverly Hills called Harry Harris Shoes. I, I don't know if that's true, but I have nothing to do with that shoe store, but I think I'm gonna go buy me some shoes here uh, uh, in a day or two. Children's shoes, well, there you have it. Uh, but allow me to take a moment and acknowledge uh, everyone here from the Los Angeles World Affairs Council your, and your officers, including your chairman, uh, Michael Siegel, and your president, of course, uh, Terry McCarthy. I want to acknowledge the members of the diplomatic and consular corps, of which there are many tonight. I want to acknowledge our veterans and fellow flag officers, including uh, Admiral Blair uh, and uh, my good friends, uh, Matt Spence, uh, Eric Nishizawa, uh, Eric Shanks, and Larry Jones, and industry leaders, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be here tonight to discuss the importance of the Indo-Asia Pacific to the United States. I'll, I'll try not to talk too long, although, uh, though, because I've been told that it's best to leave your audience before your audience leaves you. <laughs> so I'm honored to join this accomplished collection of leaders and scholars here in Santa Monica, also known as Silicon Beach. Your diverse and informed opinions are part and parcel of the incubator of ideas that makes Los Angeles such an impactful place. I'm very impressed by the World Affairs Council network, specifically the Los Angeles branch. Since 1953, you've inspired Americans to better understand the outside world and the critical global issues of our times. So it's very apropos that this conference is titled The Future of Asia, because I believe that the future of the United States is inextricably linked to this dynamic region. Thanks to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, events like this help us all to dig deep to analyze issues that impact our nation. Something especially needed in this day and age of instant news and sound bites that simply scratch the surface. But since I know there are media in the room, I'll try to say something tweetable, <laughs> and fewer than 140 characters, of course. So perhaps it's best that I set the stage by providing a little context about the United States Pacific Command, or PACOM, America's oldest and largest military combatant command that's headquartered in Hawaii. We're made up of about 380,000 personnel, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guards, and DOD civilians who stand watch over half the Earth. Normally, I say that our area of responsibility stretches from Bollywood to Hollywood and from penguins to polar bears, <laughs> but not tonight. Tonight, I'll say that PACOM's region stretches from Silicon Beach in Southern California to the, to the Silicon Plateau in Bangalore, India places which are becoming the epicenter for global innovation. This region spans 14 time zones and contains 36 countries. Although many refer to the region as the Asia Pacific, I prefer calling it the Indo-Asia Pacific. This term more accurately captures for me the fact that the Indian and Pacific Oceans are the economic lifeblood that links India and Australia in Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, Oceania, and the United States together. In my opinion, all of these areas must be included in a discussion on the future of Asia. Strengthening the security, diplomatic, and economic connective tissue throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific is what America's ongoing rebalance is all about. The whole of government rebalance is an intentional effort based on a strategy of collaboration and cooperation. And PACOM is right in the center of implementing the security aspects of the rebalance. Since its establishment in 1947, PACOM has been responsible for all 
U.S. military operations in the Indo-Asia Pacific, including exercises and activities designed to strengthen our alliances and expand our regional partnerships. So over the past 70 years, the Indo-Asia Pacific has been one of the world's great success stories. Completely transformed since the end of World War II, the region is now home to the world's three largest economies and seven of the eight fastest growing markets. Each year, approximately $5.3 trillion in annual global trade transits to the South China Sea, and $1.2 trillion of this sea-based trade involves the United States. This global trade relies on unimpeded sea lanes. In fact, in the Strait of Malacca alone, the Strait of Malacca alone sees over 25 percent of global oil shipments and 50 percent of all natural gas shipments daily. What happens in the Indo-Asia Pacific matters to America. So let there be no doubt the United States is a vital part of this region with fundamental national interests at stake. This region is critically important to Los Angeles, to Chattanooga, and to our nation, now and into the future. In fact, the Indo-Asia Pacific has seven of the world's ten largest armies, which means the area also shapes the course of global security. And even with the belligerent North Korea, this region has experienced decades of relative peace and stability. This secure environment has facilitated an increase in prosperity unequal in human history. In my opinion, the success story has been made possible in large part by the rules-based security architecture in the region, supported by seven decades of U.S. forward military presence and underpinned by, five, by America's five bilateral security alliances, those alliances with Australia, with Japan, the Philippines, South Korea, and Thailand. And we're enhancing our mutual security by deepening our partnerships with nations like Indonesia and Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, Vietnam, and many others. A bright spot I'll specifically mention is the growing U.S.-India relationship. As the world's two largest democracies, we are uniquely poised, in my opinion, to help bring greater security and prosperity to the entire region. And I think that's primarily because of two visionary policies that are now converging at the perfect time. Shortly after President Obama announced America's rebalance in 2011, Prime Minister Modi implemented his Act East policy. The results have been impressive. The Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, or DTTI, has proven to be an effective mechanism to enable, enable closer defense and industrial ties between our two nations. It allows us to take advantage of opportunities to strengthen our defense through collaboration by focusing on the larger strategic picture rather than succumbing to old think and outdated bureaucratic obstacles. For example, for instance, this framework has allowed us to work together on technology to improve jet engines and aircraft carriers, to name a few. Our deepening cooperation with India, based on shared values and shared concerns, is becoming the key partnership that defines the rebalance and arguably American engagement in the region in the 21st century. India is just one of the many countries in this region which have demonstrated a commitment to long-standing customary international law the principles of which provide the foundation of the rules-based order, the peaceful resolution of disputes, freedom of navigation for military and civilian ships and aircraft, and unimpeded lawful commerce. These principles are not abstractions, nor are they subject to the whims of any one country. They are not privileges to be granted or withdrawn they make sense because they have worked for decades to keep the peace while creating prosperous economic conditions to lift more than a billion people out of poverty. Now, that sounds rosy, right? But I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the challenges that are underpinning the current rules-based international order. Secretary of Defense Ash Carter has rightly called the Indo-Asia Pacific the single most 
consequential region for America's future. The single most consequential region for America's future. He's also identified five strategic and very real global challenges to U.S. security that drive our defense planning and budgeting. North Korea, China, Russia, the Islamic State or ISIL, and Iran. And guess what? Four of these challenges are resident in the PACOM area of responsibility. We can't turn a blind eye to these challenges, and we can't give any nation or insidious non-state actor a pass if they purposefully erode the rules-based security order. In the here and now, ISIL is a clear threat that must be destroyed. The main focus of our military effort is rightfully on the Middle East and North Africa, as coalition forces continue to attack those savages throughout Syria, Iraq, and Libya. But as ISIL is squeezed out of those geographic areas, it will undoubtedly seek to operate in others. Population numbers alone have forced PACOM to think ahead about what's next in the fight against ISIL. There are far more Muslims living in the PACOM area than in the Middle East and Southwest Asia. The vast majority of these people are peaceful folks who seek to live free lives, or, free, or live lives rather free from terrorism. They want to raise their families and pursue their dreams just like every American, just like each of us in this room. But we know that a small band of terrorists of fanatics can produce deadly results. In 2016 alone, we've witnessed ISIL-inspired terrorism in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. So it's clear to me that ISIL is trying to rebalance to the Indo-Asia Pacific. So we must stop them now, but we can't do it alone. To halt ISIL's cancerous spread, we must work together with like-minded nations in the region and across the globe. Multinational efforts are underway right now to meet this challenge. Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines recently agreed to deepen cooperation to fight regional piracy and related kidnap for ransom in the Sulu Sea. The Abu Sayyaf Group, a Philippine-based terrorist organization whose leader has sworn allegiance to ISIL, is responsible for much of this activity. Cooperative efforts in this vast and largely ungoverned maritime area connecting these three nations and their thousands of islands will help deny these terrorists maneuver space and revenue sources. This, this, this partnership, along with the armed forces of the Philippines, is renewed offensive against the group is already having meaningful results. Counterterror cooperation between Singapore and Indonesia is another high point. Because of the coordination between these two nations, a plot by a terrorist cell with links to ISIL to conduct an attack in Singapore was broken up by Indonesian security forces. Many other like-minded nations, Australia, Japan, and New Zealand, to name a few, have joined the coalition dedicated to ISIL's complete destruction. PACOM, including the Special Operations Command Pacific, or SOC PAC, supports these efforts to improve cooperation against this nemesis to humanity. Through multinational collaboration, we can eradicate this ISIL disease before it metastasizes throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific. But ISIL isn't our only immediate threat. North Korea stands out as the only nation to have tested nuclear weapons in this century. Last week's nuclear test, North Korea's largest ever and the second this year alone, follows an unprecedented campaign of provocations, including ballistic missile launches, which Pyongyang claims are intended to serve as delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons targeting the United States and our allies, South Korea and Japan. Now, I want you to stop for a minute and really think about this. Combining nuclear warheads with ballistic missile technology in the hands of a volatile leader like Kim Jong-un is a recipe for disaster. Uh, now, I know there's some debate about the miniaturization advancements made by Pyongyang, but PACOM must be prepared to fight tonight, so I take them at their word. I must assume that their claims are true. 
there, I know their aspirations certainly are. So we must consider every possible step to defend the U.S. homeland and our allies. That's why the Republic of Korea-U.S. alliance has decided to deploy the THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense System, in South Korea as soon as possible. I continue to call on China to exert its considerable influence on North Korea to stop this madness. That's why I also continue to emphasize trilateral cooperation between Japan, Korea, and the United States. That's why all nations must continue to rally the international community to loudly condemn North Korea's aberrational behavior and be prepared to counter this challenge. Other significant challenges are posed by revanchist Russia and an assertive China. Both Moscow and Beijing have choices to make. They can choose to disregard the rules-based international order, or they can contribute to it as responsible stakeholders. I've been loud and clear that I prefer cooperation so that we can collectively address our shared security challenges. Regardless, America's ironclad commitments to our treaty allies will never waver. And across this region, including in the East and South China Seas, the United States will continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows, and support the right of all nations to do the same. From my perspective, we will continue to cooperate where we can, and we will be ready to confront where we must. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm often asked about what to do in the face of these challenges. In the face of these challenges that I've spent the last few minutes talking about, and my response is twofold. First, as the PACOM commander, I must be ready to confront all of these challenges from a position of strength with credible combat power. Second, I need help to find creative solutions to the challenges ahead of us. Fortunately, I think I've come to the right place that can support me on both counts. From Silicon Beach to Silicon Valley and throughout our nation, I need visionaries to continue developing cutting-edge technology that helps our military maintain our significant asymmetric advantages. Thanks to America's strategic rebalance, everything that's new and cool in the U.S. military arsenal is coming first to the Pacific. Advanced aircraft like the Joint Strike Fighter, the P-8 Poseidon, the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, more UAVs like the Triton and the Stingray, more advanced aerial platforms like the V-22 Osprey, and more new ships like the Gerald Ford-class aircraft carriers and the littoral combat ships. And then there's the DDG-1000. The lead ship, the USS Zumwalt, is scheduled to be commissioned next month and then be homeported in San Diego. Folks, this region is getting a ship that even the Klingons would fear. <laughs> and the destroyer's skipper's name is Captain James Kirk. <laughs> you just can't make this up. <laughs> Folks, this is serious business. If we have to fight tonight, I don't want it to be a fair fight. If it's a knife fight, I want to bring a gun. If it's a gun fight, I want to bring in the artillery and all of our partners with their artillery. But as I said during congressional testimony last year, sequestration could reduce us to wielding a butter knife in that knife fight. So getting sequestration repealed is the first of three issues where we could use the support and brain power of those in this room. The second issue is a Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Now, no one should misconstrue my comments about TPP as lobbying for legislation. Those of us who wear the uniform of our country know better. And anyone who's met me know that I'm no economist. I have enough problems just balancing my checkbook and this e-banking thing simply frightens me. But I'd be remiss in talking about the future of Asia if I didn't mention the security aspects, that's my lane, the security aspects of the proposed 12-nation agreement that would account for nearly 40% of the world's GDP. 
You don't have to be an economist to know that the foundation of American security is a strong economy, and the economic future of the United States lies in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Increased trade binds nations closer together because there's more to lose when there's instability. TPP, in my opinion, would strengthen stability and security by deepening our relationships throughout the region and raising the bar to entry to protect the things that matter to us. Things like enhanced cybersecurity, things like counter uh, privacy, or things like pri uh, privacy and those things that would run counter to it, and intellectual property protections. TPP's provisions to combat the theft of trade secrets, including by cyber threat, protect our defense industrial base. And obviously, our partners who've signed up for TPP see it as a vital demonstration of America's enduring commitment to the region. The third and final issue is UNCLOS, or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. I think the recent arbitral tribunal uh, ruling on the South China Sea validates the strategic importance of UNCLOS and argues for U.S. ratification to the convention. The United States policy is to fully adhere to the provisions in UNCLOS, and our military forces around the world reinforce the convention standards by operating consistent with the rules in UNCLOS. But in my personal opinion, I believe that by not ratifying it, we lose some of the credibility for the very thing that we're arguing for, full commitment and respect for the rules and norms in the international arena. While some good people argue that we should not ratify the treaty, I think the positives outweigh the negatives. I believe we should align with most of the world. In fact, over 160 countries enjoy an UNCLOS. At the end of the day, America is a beacon of freedom and hope across the world for sure. But that light shines brighter if we ratify UNCLOS. So folks, a lot of you in this room tonight probably don't know that Terry McCarthy speaks six languages. By now, because of the length of this speech, I'm sure he's picked up a seventh. <laughs> Tennessean, right? So I'd like to close with a thought on how blessed we are as a nation, because we have the freedom to participate in an open forum like this and debate important issues. Last Sunday marked the 15th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on our homeland that forever changed our country and our entire joint force. It's not lost on me that we've been at war these past 15 years, these past 15 Septembers of sacrifices made by those in uniform and their families. We're fortunate to have men and women who volunteer to serve our country, whether it's to keep the peace in Asia or to go in harm's way in Afghanistan and Iraq. But we've also, we're also richly blessed to have informed citizens Patriots like you who are aware of the challenges, opportunities, and dangers that we face in the Indo-Asia Pacific and around the world. You play an important part in shaping our nation's future, developing new centers of influence here in Los Angeles and beyond to help ensure that the United States maintains our global leadership position. A great American leader and the only person to ever be both Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. General George C. Marshall once noted, democracy is the most demanding of all forms of government in terms of the energy, the imagination, and public spirit required of the individual. Your participation in this conference and your imagination demonstrates to me your public spirit and that you are putting skin to the game by looking for real solutions to complex problems. May God bless each person in this room. May God bless this city of angels. And may God bless the land of liberty that we call America. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
to give you this microphone if you wanted to walk around. So I know the Admiral has to fly back to Hawaii tonight, but he has agreed to take some questions from the floor. I'm going to exercise my moderator's privilege and ask the first one, because uh, I wanted to ask you about the South China Sea. You talked a little bit about uh, China's choice to collaborate or to uh, not collaborate with a the, with the rules-based order. Um, how do you see that working out in the South China Sea? It's, it's been a little bit rocky recently. How do you see that playing out? So uh, thanks for that question. Uh, so, so let me talk about China a little bit. Uh, I don't want to ever be accused of pitching a case for a new Cold War uh, with China. I, I think that, uh, that there are many areas uh, in which we do collaborate, uh, and there are many areas in which we can potentially collaborate with China. China is a great nation, just like the United States, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and many other nations represented in this room. So uh, when I talk about China, I try to talk about uh, China on the one hand, the good things they're doing. So China is, has been involved in the middle-to-middle -middle area. This is my area of expertise. We have worked with China uh, in uh, counter piracy efforts off the Horn of Africa. They're on their 22nd or 23rd iteration of that. Uh, China contributed uh, to the effort to remove uh, chemical weapons from Syria. Uh, China was involved in the search for the missing Malaysian airliner uh, off the coast of, of uh, Australia in the southern part of the Indian Ocean. China has been involved in RIMPAC, the Rim of the Pacific Exercise. The first time was in 2014. We invited them back for 2016. So these are positive things that China does, and we should acknowledge that, and I do acknowledge that. On the other hand, though, there's always the other hand. On the other hand, China is responsible, in my opinion, uh, for tensions and provocations in East Asia, most notably uh, in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. I believe that China, uh, as Secretary of Defense Carter mentioned last week, I believe that China is not doing all it could do uh, to rein in Kim Jong-un uh, and uh, uh, Pyongyang's uh, nuclear uh, ambitions. So I, I call on China to do more, to do that, as I, as I mentioned before. So uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, we are collaborating and cooperating with China across a broad front of, of uh, security issues. And I'm not going to touch the other uh, aspects of, uh, of our relationships with China, whether it's uh, our uh, positive relationships and, and, and uh, commerce and trade and all of that. But in the security arena, we are collaborating and cooperating with China across a, a broad spectrum of, uh, of uh, uh, events. But on the other hand, China uh, can do more, and I think they should do more, in reducing tensions, eliminating provocations in East Asia among uh, uh, the nations there, uh, and they should do more uh, to help rein in uh, Kim Jong-un uh, and his uh, nuclear ambitions. We have a, a microphone here. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand, and Alexander, the tallest man in the room, will find you. Uh, there's, there's a new leader in the Philippines. Say again? There's a new leader in the Philippines. We'd like to hear what, from the military side, what's really going on. Because uh, apparently, he doesn't want American troops in Mindanao. He's now talking about procuring weapons from Russia and China. Um, what's your opinion? Thanks. Uh, so I was in the Philippines uh, a little over a week ago, uh, and I met with uh, my counterpart, the new uh, Chief of Defense, uh, uh, General uh, Ricardo uh, Visaya. Uh, and with regard to President Duterte's recent comments, uh, we have received no official word from the government of the Philippines on the things that he has said or the things he has called for. So, uh, so today, uh, our operations, the PACOM's uh, operations uh, and engagements uh, with the government of the Philippines, particularly the AFP, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, has not changed, hasn't changed one bit. Uh, with regard to what President Duterte really means uh, by his statements, I can only refer you to, to him. 
I, I don't know exactly what he means. But my relationships, I mean, my uh, uh, discussions with my counterparts suggest that we are on a, on a good footing in the Philippines. But, I, but I'll talk about some of those specific things that he has said. So a few weeks ago, uh, at a ribbon-cutting ceremony for a facility that China had funded uh, in the Philippines, uh, President Duterte said, only China supports us. Only China supports us. So I, I, I'm not sure what he means. Uh, I hope you, you, you do ask him. But I do know that factually, the United States, just in the last year or two, has provided almost $120 million of support to the Philippines to improve their military. You know, 42 out of $50 million in our new maritime security initiative uh, went to the Philippines. DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, uh, has built a new $44 million uh, uh, coastal watch center there in order to help the Philippines improve their maritime domain awareness so they can see and understand what's out there operating in their exclusive uh, economic zone. Uh, and uh, there are other initiatives like that so that the total is about $120 million. It's only been about three years since the worst typhoon in recent memory hit, uh, hit the Philippines, uh, Typhoon uh, Haiyan. And, and within two days of, of uh, passage of that hurricane, we had sent uh, an aircraft carrier strike group there to render assistance. And shortly after that, an amphibious ready group with Marines from the uh, Third Marine Expeditionary Force were there to help the Philippines. So another instance of someone uh, else uh, supporting and helping the Philippines. So I, was, I would just uh, suggest that, that, that you ask uh, President Duterte what he means when he says that no one supports us uh, but China. Recently he's called, as you, as you indicated, he's called for the, uh, for the removal of U.S. Special Operations Forces, I talked about them in my, in my remarks, uh, from SOCPAC, Spe Special Operations Command Pacific. Uh, he's called for their removal from Mindanao uh, in the southern part of the Philippines. They're there. They are there. I've got to forgive my Tennessee accent here. They are there at the request of the government of the Philippines over a number of administrations. Uh, and they're there to help the Philippines defeat the Abu Sayyaf group, this ISIL-affiliated group that's operating in uh, the southern Philippines. So we're there at their request to help them get better uh, and improve their own security. So when he calls for the removal of SOF, Special Operations Forces, from Mindanao, uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, wh what he means. And then, and then, uh, uh, mo most uh, recently, uh, he's called for uh, no joint patrols. So the, the regime, the framework for the joint patrols were established about a year ago uh, at the request of the government of the Philippines in coordination with them in order to have patrols in and over the South China Sea in areas that matter first to the Philippines. So uh, we're going to work through all this. Uh, I'm, I'm not pessimistic about it. Uh, the, our relationship, as I said, uh, with the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the government of the Philippines hasn't changed at all. So uh, I think we'll work through this and, and we'll come out in the right place. Good evening, Admiral Harris. My name is Janet Hernandez and I'm from Vaughn Next Century Learning Center. Under what conditions would the U.S. take unilateral action to stop the progression of North Korea's nuclear program? Uh, I'm not going to talk about future war plans uh, and, and plans. I'm just not going to do it. It's just, it's just uh, best that, that we left that unsaid. But we work very closely, hand in hand, uh, with our South Korean uh, ally. So the decisions that we make, like the decision to uh, put uh, THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense System, uh, in Korea, that decision is an alliance decision. It's not a decision made independently uh, by Seoul uh, or by Washington. It's an alliance decision made together. And the specific place where it goes, when it goes in, all of that uh, will be an alliance decision. And we will work hand in hand uh, with the Republic of Korea military uh, and their uh, security uh, framework 
in order to be ready uh, against any provocation uh, that uh, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, could deploy. Admiral, in 2012, President Obama and along with the Pentagon, Pentagon said that they were going to relocate our troops from theater in the Middle East to that of the Pacific Theater, and they labeled it Pacific Pivot. Would you mind giving us a status and elaborating on that? Yeah, so, so uh, I get asked a lot, you know, is the rebalance for real, is the pivot for real, you know, can we afford it in, in the face of the, of the, of the sequestration and, and all the other fiscal pressures that we have? Uh, I will tell you that, to begin with, that the rebalance to the Indo-Asia Pacific uh, is not a military-only thing. It's, there are really four components to the, to the rebalance. There's the economic piece, the military piece, the diplomatic piece, uh, and the political piece. So the four components. The biggest component of the, of the uh, rebalance is the economic piece, because it's the most important piece. But the most visible piece uh, is the military piece, because you can see this DDG-1000, you can see aircraft carriers, striker brigades, uh, Ospreys, and all this stuff. You can see the military hardware. So uh, the military dimension or the component of the rebalance looks, looks big. But the most important component uh, is the uh, economic piece. So, but I, let me speak to what I know best. Remember, I don't know e economics, but I, I do know the military. And uh, I believe that we've been very successful in the, in the rebalance to the Pacific in terms of that military component. Uh, to date, and by 2020, which is only three years away, your United States Navy will have 60% uh, of our ships, aircraft, and submarines in total. 60% of your Navy will be in the Pacific. 60% of your United States Air Force will be based in the Pacific. And now when I say in the Pacific, I'm including the West Coast of the United States, though those of you who are defense policy nerds know that the, physically that's in the uh, uh, Northern Command area of responsibility, but those forces are Pacific Command forces. So 60% of your Navy, 60% of your Air Force, 66% of Marine Corps striking power will be in the Pacific by 2020. And the United States Army, you know, the United States Army upgunned the, uh, uh, their uh, command in Hawaii from a three-star to a four-star, and then they assigned uh, 106,000 soldiers, 36,000 more than were assigned before, 106,000 soldiers to uh, uh, PACOM authority, to Pacific Command authority. So I think when you look at all of that, I believe I can stand in front of you and tell you that the military component of the of the rebalance is measurable, and it's real, and, and we're almost there. Uh, Admiral Dick Drobnik, the USC Marshall School of Business. Can you clarify for us what you think is the one most or two most important threats to the political economic stability in your region, in PACOM? Yeah, so I'm going to try to take a broader view, and I'll say that one of the threats to, uh, to uh, uh, security is, is sequestration. So for all the reasons I, I remarked, I talked about in my remarks, uh, I testified in 2013 before the Senate Armed Services Committee that sequestration would bring us to our knees. Uh, and, and I believe that that, that poses a, a threat, not a military threat, but a but a broader strategic threat, if you will. In the military sense, uh, I believe that North Korea poses the most immediate, imminent threat to the United States, our friends and our allies in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Now, I, I recognize that, that Russia is an existential threat to the United States. China is a big threat, uh, potentially, as well. Uh, but uh, the immediate threat is is North Korea, because you've got a leader who's in complete command and control of his military and his nation. He's on a quest for nuclear weapons, the means to uh, miniaturize them and then mate them to a warhead or mate them to a, to a missile and then launch them against the United States. He poses a real threat to our South Korean ally, 
the 28,000 American troops who live and work uh, in uh, uh, South Korea and their families, the three or 400,000 Americans who live and work in Korea tonight. He poses a, an immediate threat to our, our, our Japan ally, Americans who live and work there, the 50,000 American servicemen and women who are stationed there, uh, their families, and, and the hundreds of thousands of, of American businessmen and women and, and others who live and work in Japan. He poses a real threat to Guam, uh, an American territory, to Hawaii, and the West Coast of the United States. Uh, and so I view uh, North Korea as the most immediate threat that we face. I don't know. I think uh, today, uh, this evening, it's good uh, you mentioned China's uh, two face, uh, something China also done a lot of good things. And uh, I just sense uh, in today's uh, uh, speech, you mentioned a lot of uh, North Korea threat. Is it uh, because of this uh, North Korea, the imminent threat, uh, then you think uh, China should uh, take more responsibility at this time? So you put China aside and North Korea the first. Uh, uh, North Korea uh, threat become a kind of a priority. Um, I, I think I, I agree with you. Uh, the North Korea threat is the priority. Uh, I do believe that China can do more, and I believe that China should do more. Uh, North Korea has only one uh, benefactor or friend or, or, or whatever you want to call it in the, in the world, and that's China. You know, we have friends, allies, and partners all over the Indo-Asia Pacific, and, and China has, has uh, North Korea. I think we come out on the very end of that stick. But I believe that, that uh, China can and should do more. Uh, you know, I, I was uh, criticized recently for advocating uh, for THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense System. I was criticized by China for advocating for THAAD placement in Korea as if THAAD was a threat to China, which it is not. But we're putting THAAD uh, together with South Korea. We're putting THAAD in Korea because of the threat from uh, North Korea. So, uh, so I would prefer that China, rather than criticize me for supporting THAAD in Korea, our ally, I would rather China expend that energy and uh, reign uh, Kim Jong-un uh, under control. So the Admiral does have a plane to catch, and we're going to have to stop it there. I'm sorry. I'm sure we could ask questions all night long. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and Admiral Harris, thank you for so much for such a great speech.